Welcome to New Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church Sunday Service. Under the dynamic leadership of the Reverend Dr. Lorenzo Neal, we are located at 2202 Decatur Street in the city with soul, Jackson, Mississippi. Join us online at Facebook, YouTube, and our website, newbethelljacksonms.org. We are a church where God is our Father, Christ is our Redeemer, the Holy Spirit is our Comforter, and humanity is our family. Here are this week's announcements and weekly ministry opportunities. Are you interested in helping New Bethel? Join our ministry team as a volunteer. Work with media, youth, or in Christian education. Email newbetheljacksonms at gmail.com to learn more and sign up today. Get your copy of Dr. Neal's books available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and LorenzoTNeal.com. You will be blessed. Join us for weekly prayer with the Southwest District, Mondays at 7 o'clock p.m. Dial 605-475-4749, enter code 327-074, and pound. Join us Tuesdays at noon for Bible study with Dr. Neal, streamed live on our church Facebook page. Gain insight and scripture that will bless you throughout the week. Join us for Sunday School, Sundays at 9 a.m. by way of teleconference. 701-802-5157 into code 412-1360. Our mission is to minister to the social, spiritual, economical, and physical development of all, of all people. Our vision is to be a church where people experience the Lord on every level, where God's Word is explained and experienced on every level, where people feel welcome, loved, and accepted, and where every person is relational encouraging, authentic, and loving. Again, welcome to Sunday Service. We're glad that you're here. Join us now in service. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. 
Our feet have been standing within thy gates, O Jerusalem. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Lord, I love the habitation of your house, the place where your glory dwells. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's do so by lifting up a hymn of the church, old standard that uh, used to be psalm back in the day, called There's Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you, or victory, or, or sin, the victory win? There's power in the wonderful one. It's a wonder working power in the blood. Would you be free from your passion of pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you be whiter, yes, brighter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in his life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder-working power. In the blood of the Lamb, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Let's lift our voice and sing this wonderful, wonderful praise song.
our time of prayer this morning. We are soliciting your prayers on behalf of Sister Zena, who is recovering from uh, knee surgery. I was made sure to make that announcement so I won't get in trouble. <laughs> so y'all pray for her and her recovery. We continue to solicit your prayers on behalf of those who lost loved ones this week. And you read the local news, you know there's been a lot of violence in the state, not just in Jackson. Lord have mercy. Holmes County, uh, Scott County, all these other rural areas are seeing the same kind of violence. Gun violence, domestic violence, senseless death. Please pray for those who lost loved ones and those from those occurrences. Continue to pray for the family of icons, civil rights icons who uh, we lost just over the last two weeks. And uh, we are seeing, we're seeing them go and people are forgetting their legacies. So let us pray and children remember what they did to help us as we go just into next month highlight their memory and their legacy and not just those but those who are still alive we need to continue to remember them we solicit your prayers of course on behalf of our family here in New Bethel the Mayberry the Johnsons uh, Sister Geraldine Brookins uh, Sister Robert Burke others that I may have forgotten you, you all know who they are we call their names anybody you know call their names out who's standing in the need of, the, of prayer we'll continue to solicit your prayers on behalf of our mayor and Talamumba Chokwa and Talamumba our governor Tate Reeves and our president Joe Biden for our presiding bishop Bishop Stafford J.N. Wicker supervisor Reverend Dr. Constance Wicker for our presiding elder, the Reverend Diane J. Banks, and, and consultant Tony Banks, for all the presiding elders, pastors, clergy, and members of the Southwest District Mississippi Conference and Eighth Episcopal District and the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Solicit your prayers on behalf of every church door that is open, that those were even open on yesterday, and those clergy who will be standing before people proclaiming the word of God. Most of all, we solicit your prayers for one another. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, our Savior, our Redeemer, the Ancient of Days, Thou who is, who was, and who is to come. We are thankful for this day. We thank you just for allowing us to see this 22nd day of January because you brought us from day one to this day without any hurt, harm, or danger. Through many dangers, toil, and snare, you have been good to us. Thank you, God. Thank you for watching over us as we slept in slumber and no bad news came to our, our ears. And we woke up, Father God, with reasonable portions of health and strength and a mind to come to your, your house to worship you. Thank you. Thank you for keeping us through the week in the midst of all our interactions with other people, in the midst of mood changes and weather changes. You still have been good. And we're grateful, God. Lord, look and have mercy is our prayer this morning as we lift up those names that have been called, those petitions that have been made known to you, God, whatever, however, and whoever whomever God we know that you are hearing and we thank you God look and have mercy on our children look and have mercy on our educators look and have mercy on our legislators look and have mercy oh God on all people who are calling on you for something somebody needs you in the hospital room somebody needs you in the nursing home somebody needs you in the prison cell somebody needs you in a home where there's domestic violence child abuse and neglect look and have mercy we need you right here in New Bethel, Lord God. We know we need you and we can't make it without you. Hear our faintest cry, oh God, and please have mercy and answer by and by. 
And God, we just thank you that you are answering our prayers according to your will as we, as we make our petitions known to you, God. Look and have mercy. And we'll be careful in this moment to give your name all the praise, all the glory that it deserves. For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power, the glory, now and always. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Let's lift our voice and sing in this wonderful refrain of worship. Hallelujah. For he is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. Every knee shall. Our scripture reading comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there would be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized by my name, in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made valid, void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. I read to you a little over verse 18. But, uh, I read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 19. The word of God from the people of God. From all that dwells. Summary of the Decalogue. Hear what Christ your Savior says. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. You should love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Glory be to the Father. Amen. 
Here are a few announcements that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, the Sister Ramona Mosey, the WMS, will have a Zoom meeting Monday, January 30th, uh, 2023, at 6 o'clock. And uh, she will be sending out the Zoom information uh, soon. The church school, again, meets every Sunday at 10 a.m. We're asking you that you join us. We're also, as stated before, we continue to ask those who persons who may be interested in teaching uh, that you would join us and uh, see Dr. Jernigan for more information about that. We are preparing to update our member directory. We want to make sure that we have the proper information, uh, phone numbers, addresses, uh, contact information so that we can share pertinent information to you um, as they come. So please, if you have not done so, uh, please uh, provide updated information. Also, email addresses. Uh, we do have a email uh, uh, group. Uh, I don't know how to say that, but we have an email that we send out regularly, consistent, and we want to make sure that information that uh, can get to you virtually by way of email. Uh, on this past Tuesday, the lay organization had a wonderful meeting, and Dr. Jernigan wants to thank all those who joined the virtual meeting uh, there, and she is encouraging all members to continue to call 311. Uh, on Monday, we did a wonderful uh, cleanup uh, down the street and uh, around the corner, and uh, as you know, uh, we are putting pressure on the, on the city to really uh, do their part in helping ensure that this community is not only safe but also clean. So if you'll be kind, um, continue to call not a 311 to inform them of the, the things that are being dumped on not just our street but in this community. We, we were cleaning up what we found, a commode, a sink, <laughs> in the ditch. We couldn't pick that up and put them in bags. So uh, we're just encouraging, you know, we want this city to be great, and we want all of, especially the street where our ministry is, to be, you know, be straight. The Christian Education Department will be hosting and uh, will be having its Black History Program the fourth Sunday of February, and we are excited about that. Sister Danita Mosey is taking lead in that, and um, she's asking for children to, participate, those who are desiring to participate, parents, encourage your children to participate in the Black History Program that will be held during the service. Uh, they will be having rehearsal uh, on February the 4th, the 11th, and 18th at 10 a.m. here at the church. So we're excited about that. Uh, now on to the big announcement. As you know, our men's day is fast approaching, and we have, again, secured our speaker in the person of the Honorable James Jim Clyburn, uh, the Democratic Assistant Leader of the House of Representatives and representative from the 6th District of South Carolina. He will be here. We have locked in the time at 2 o'clock p.m., so please share. It will be... Uh, Sunday, February the 12th at 2 o'clock. Uh, we were just waiting and going back and forth, you, trying to make sure we uh, could do what we accommodate and everything, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, men who uh, will be reaching out to you for the various program participation, and women will be looking out to you for support also, and we, again, those you can and are able to uh, help in the assessment that we have asked so we can make this program successful. We're excited about it, and I'm looking forward to having a wonderful time. The flyer will go live uh, either later this evening or tomorrow, and we'll make printable flyers available for you if you'd like to share. So we're excited about all of that that's coming up. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, uh, Bishop Stafford Wicker has requested the presence of those of us here locally in Jackson to be with him as he will be celebrating the arrival of the new bishop in residence for Mississippi of the United Methodist Church. Uh, they will be welcoming that new bishop, their new bishop, 
and celebrating the arrival at 4 o'clock at the Anderson United Methodist Church on um, Highway 220. I don't know if that's the right address, but y'all know where Anderson Memorial is. And that will be this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Those of you who can and will, uh, we are all invited to support our bishop as he supports uh, the, our brother, his brother, Bishop, uh, Sister Bishop, uh, current Bishop in residence for the United Methodist Church of Mississippi, uh, this Mississippi Conference here. I think that's all that we have, and uh, anything else that needs to be brought to our attention, please let us know. And that is, that is it. We're looking forward. And again, y'all pray for Zena. I just... Y'all can tell her I said it twice. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, we'll be looking forward to a wonderful, wonderful day ahead. We are still adjusting Bible study, and I thank those of you who are able to tune in on Wednesday evening. Again, uh, I have a new schedule, and we're trying to make the adjustment and settle in on when we will uh, do the stream for Bible study. And once we get it locked in, we will adjust as necessary. All right. And that's all that we have. And let us prepare to go into the worship, to the word. And we want to sing a little song, some you may be familiar with. Called Raise the Light.
I'll let y'all sing that. <laughs> Amen. I ain't shame no. <laughs> Amen. If you have your Bibles, take turn with us to the Gospel of St. Matthew. The Gospel of St. Matthew. You have your mobile devices, you have your physical Bible, turn there. Chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, and we will begin reading at verse number 12. Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. When you have it, let it be known by saying, Amen. Hear the word of the Lord from the New American Standard Bible. Now, when Jesus heard that John had taken, been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, but on the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light and those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death upon them a light dawned from that time Jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and if you allow me just for a few moments I want to preach from the subject take the mantle and go forward. Take the mantle and go forward. Father, consecrate me now to your service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let your servant's voice be your voice, and let my will be lost in thine. As always, this your servant asks, let the words of my mouth meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight for you are our Lord are my re rock and my redeemer and the people of God said amen take the mantle and go forward the text that we read today is one of the most pivotal moments in all of the gospel narratives regarding Jesus. When you read, you find that he has had a life-changing event in the wilderness. And he's come out of that event and is now going forward into ministry. It's one of these moments that scholars have debated for centuries largely because of the way it is written when you read chapter 3 and you read how John the Baptist comes onto the scene and you read about the interaction between John the Baptist or baptizer and 
Jesus of Nazareth. The way the writer puts it intentionally crafts a shifting in both person and presence. John takes the back seat and Jesus' ministry goes forward. Scholars have argued uh, some more progressive scholars have, have even gone so far as to say that Jesus was taking advantage of a, a blank space. Uh, he was filling a void because John's being incarcerated and his disciples kind of being uh, fleeing. Uh, he saw, or the scholars suggest that he saw a vacuum in the leadership and began to do his own thing. More conservative scholars argue that this was simply Jesus' coming out event, if we would use the language of today. However, or how, whoever is interpreted, the significance of the text should not be ignored. Uh, Jesus takes up a mantle. When we look at our text, Jesus hears that John had been taken into custody. And those of you who know the story about what happened to John, he was preaching against sin. The preaching got to one of the king's uh, leader's wife, and she couldn't stand him. And the story, one of the gospel narratives says that she influenced her daughter to commit and act to get her way. She had her daughter dance for the king and his comrades. And apparently the dance was so good, you know, the king said, what do you want? Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. I don't know what kind of dancing she was doing, but it certainly wasn't, it was dirty dancing. But anyway, she had been instructed when she got to that part because she knew that the, her mother knew that the king was going to ask her. And she said, when he asks what you want, tell him I want the head of John the Baptist. So he gave in to that request and John the Baptist was arrested. And, and though it's not in chronological order in the written synopsis of the Gospels, John is in prison and his disciples have learned that Jesus has taken up this mantle and they begin to inquire first among themselves and eventually among Jesus' disciple and ultimately to Jesus himself said, are you the one or should we look for somebody else? And Jesus goes and says, go back to your, your master, go back to your leader and tell them all that you see. Now, the way, again, the way it is written in the text, in the gospel accounts, you know, is not chronological. But you can see how the stories intertwine and connect to build the narrative of Jesus' initial entry into ministry, a public ministry. So as Jesus hears all of this, Jesus had already began to make moves Moving from one place to another at this time was not only uh, a very bold move, but it was an unusual move, especially for a Jewish man of Jesus' age. Jesus, for whatever reason, when we, when we read what happens to him in the beginning of the text, you, you see where he is encountered with a divine encounter. He has this encounter with the devil. And is tempted. And overcomes that. So the first thing that I draw from. Even though not explicitly from the text that we are lifting up. First thing we have to take up the mantle of our experience. Jesus took up the mantle of his experience in the wilderness. 
and his experience with John the Baptist, having been baptized, matter of factly, I, I, we don't give enough credit to Jesus as a prophet and as a preacher. See, because one text said that Jesus' fame spread. In the, New King, in the King James, it uses the word fame. His fame spread. And the reason his fame spread because he had experiences that were unique to him. Mind you, there were many other prophets or so-called pseudo-prophets during this time. There were many other people proclaiming to be a Messiah figure. But what made Jesus stand out is the uniqueness of the experiences that he had. First, he could tell about what happened when he was born. And I want you to understand, the only reason Jesus' fame spread is because he talked about himself. Preacher, that ain't in the Bible. Jesus didn't talk about himself. The people saw that. Je look, look, y'all know how we preachers are. We like talking about ourselves. We like telling when we have an encounter with God. We want to say, the Lord spoke to me. We want to, we want to let you know that we are in tune and we've had unique experiences. We like to share our calling. Matter of fact, when I was a kid, and I made my announcement that I was called to preach. Every older preacher that I went to said, what did you see? What experience did you have? I said, I didn't have no experience. I just, I just know. And the elder priest was like, no, come back and let us know. Because you need to have something to let you know that the Lord is calling you. At 12 years old, I I had a big fantasy imagination. I'm sure I could have made something up. I, but I couldn't because I hadn't had an experience. But eventually I, I did have an experience that I connected with my calling. And when I shared that experience, then my pastor, yeah, yeah, I can confirm that was from the Lord. And though not explicitly written in the context of the, the gospel narratives where Jesus talks about himself, just, just know you don't get people attention without saying something about yourself. That's why today uh, when we go out and speak, we have bios so we can know about that person. But that person has to provide the information for the bio to make the people think, oh, that's a, oh man, we're glad to have that person, that stature. Here, because look at what they have done or what they have accomplished and all of this. Look at all of the, the accolades that they have. They, now we, we, we're so bad off, we got Congress people making up stuff and getting elected. You get what I'm saying now? He talked so much about himself that was a lie. Folks still believed him and elected him. The point, uh, the point I'm making is that Jesus could rely on his experience not because he was trying to brag or boast or make himself look better than John the baptizer, but because the uniqueness of all the experiences that he had validated his calling, his purpose. When John baptized him, the crowd heard as he came up, they saw a dove come, and they heard what sounded like thunder saying, this is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased. Before John baptized him, John was proclaiming there's somebody coming who's greater than me. I'm baptizing you in water, but he's going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit, and I'm not even worthy to tie his laces. It is the experience. That Jesus was able to say, I, I know that I know that I know I've been changed and I got a, a purpose. So he built and he took up the mantle of his experience from Mary pondering all the things that happened to him as a baby to the things that happened to him while he was being baptized in the Jordan and the experience in the wilderness. Beloved, you, you may not have significant spiritual experience, but every last one of us got a testimony. 
You may not have the biggest testimony. We got somebody here right now sitting where God healed and, and brought back to where she needed to be health-wise. We got that testimony sitting right here. And we could testify if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? And that's why we need to take up the mantle of our experience and go out and proclaim God still can use you in spite of you. Secondly, Jesus built on his new environment. He took up the mantle of his new environment environment. As stated in my introduction, it was unusual for a grown man to even leave the house back in the day. Now, now it's different. Y'all want your kids out the house. You're you 30 years old. You're still in your mama's house. Something wrong, right? Amen, lights. But the rich <laughs> can't get rid of them. Lord, have mercy. But it was unusual for a grown man who had been trained in a particular skill to leave that skill and go to a new place and start a new thing. See, we, we, we look through the text through our contemporary eyes, and sometimes it takes away from the reality of what was happening during the days of Jesus. See, during the days of Jesus, you weren't expected to go nowhere. You lived your whole house, your whole life in one spot. You only traveled, if you were a Jew, you traveled to Jerusalem to fulfill your obligations. Other than that, you ain't go nowhere. And to leave from your hometown that you had established a relationship in, and to leave and go to a whole other place, one where there were more foreigners, and two, where there was more outcasts. Capernaum was a place that was established by Herod uh, the king, Herod the Great. It was established by him to build the income for his sovereign or semi-sovereign kingdom. It was to make him look good to his Roman leadership, you know, being the puppet king for Augustus in that area. He wanted to make sure that he could show the Roman leadership that he could develop an economy that was self-sustaining. And he built Capernaum from scratch, created the port that brought in all the fishermen to create the economy where uh, Peter, as we later read, and all those others who he saw, Jesus sees later on in the text, that they could have a sufficient income and pay taxes. Lord have mercy. Y'all get what I'm saying? Herod banked on this new economy to establish him and his legacy. Jesus moves into this place. And this is why a lot of scholars assume he must have lived a peasant life. Because there was no way he could make a full sufficient living as a carpenter. Because that was one of the lowest income that you could do. Lowest skills that you could do. Think about this for a moment. Here we have Jesus moving from a place where he was already established into a new environment. But he did it because he was taking up the mantle of the prophet who said, this is what's going to happen. Folk need to see him in this environment because they're in darkness. And the Bible says the author quotes Isaiah by saying the people who lived in darkness now saw a great light. They saw a great light because the Messiah had appeared in their presence. And all the darkness that was surrounding them, that includes the darkness of not being able to hear God's words, the darkness of going through the rituals of religion, the darkness of not being in right relationship with God because they had no true concept of who God was at the time outside of just making worthy sacrifices to make them look good. They now had the opportunity to see the light. The one who was coming to give light and the one who is the light. He took up the mantle, as Isaiah said, upon them. 
now the light has dawned. He took up this mantle having shared his experience with John the baptizer, and having gone through the experience of uh, being tempted by the devil and coming out victorious. Now he is in this new environment proclaiming to people things that they had not heard in centuries. He, took, he takes up this mantle, leaving the comfort of Nazareth into a place where he was surely to be rejected because he didn't fit in. And lastly, the text shows us one other thing that is unique about Jesus and him taking up this mantle. He takes up the mantle of engagement. He takes up the mantle of engagement by taking up the mantle of the message of John the baptizer. John the baptizer was, was out in the wilderness in the Jordan proclaiming this message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and folk were coming to him. And he had the nerve to say, you brood of vipers, who told you to come here? Y'all don't really get what I'm getting to you, but yet you're here. And since you're here, you might as well get what you need. And now Jesus was taking up that engagement. Jesus now began to go in the small villages around the Galilee. He began to proclaim what John had, began, had been, been saying. And though people did not fully connect him with John, they did connect with the message. Jesus Preached the mantle of repentance because Jesus understood the environment where he was. The environment was people who had been rejected because of their own denial of who God was and wanted for them. And now he's proclaiming to them, your rejection is ending if you take up repentance. The rejection and the desolation and the isolation that you feel under Roman oppression will come to an end and will bring about deliverance for you if you repent. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not the kingdom of Herod, not the kingdom of Augustus, not the kingdom of any other kings who will follow, but the kingdom that reigned before and reigned now and will reign in the future, the kingdom of heaven. He had to remind the folk, uh, you're not citizens of the Galilee or Capernaum or Bethany. You're citizens of the kingdom. And I think we need to take up that mantle right now because uh, we got so many folk who forget their kingdom people. Uh, Y'all know, we, we like to remind folk that we live in the United States, especially some of our fair-skinned brothers and sisters. They, they love to brag that they are U.S. citizens. They're going to make sure they stand and, and take the pledge with pride, and if you kneel, you're going to get cut off. No. Because they understand that they are citizens of the United States. But, but you're, while you're citizens of the United States, if you ain't careful, you're going to be a citizen somewhere else if you don't know Jesus. Lord have mercy. He reminded them that theirs was a kingdom not under earthly rule. Theirs was a kingdom ordained by God, serviced by David. And now will be fulfilled in the same way as David. He had to remind the people, you doing all this work thinking you're going to live a good life. But the good life only comes in the kingdom life. And I know in the Christian circle, the, this word kingdom has been overutilized and, and we don't really fully understand. But let me help you understand by what it means to be a kingdom person, to live in the kingdom and be kingdom-minded. It just simply means you know who your king is. Uh, not the president, not the governor, not the mayor, not anybody you fancy to be in a, a great sphere of leadership or influence. Your king should be your lord. 
your Lord should be Jesus. And you should have right relationship with God because of your faith in Jesus. We're living in a day now where the engagement of Christians to the world is poor in quality and quantity. It's poorer in quality and quantity because we want folk in, but we don't want to tell them the truth. We want them to be comfortable, but we don't want them to repent. We want the preachers, we want to look good and make boasts, especially in me church. We want to make boast of what we have when we make our reports and say all the good things so we can go back. Instead of being honest and saying, we're not fully preaching the kingdom because we're not seeing people come to the altar in real repentance. It's time for us to take up the mantle of our experience. We know we saved. At least I hope we know we saved. If we are saved, we must take up the mantle of our experience and we must just testify God has been good to us. God is being good to us. God will be good to us. And we don't have to go on it day by day. We just know whatever day it is, God is good all the time. We need to take up the mantle of our environment. It doesn't matter where we are. We are not of this world. We are not to be conformed to this world. We are not to be a part of this world. We are supposed to be telling folk, come out of this world and come into the ark of safety. I like the way they say, it's the old ship of Zion. I don't know where you are, but you need to get on board. It's landed right where you are. Doesn't matter if you're on the west side or east side or Decatur Street or, or MLK or Mega Evans, wherever you are, God is still calling softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling for you to come out. Get out of your environment. Get out of the place where you used to and get into the ark of safety. And we need to take up the mantle of engagement. We need to be not dismayed, whatever betide, and know God will take care of us. But we also need to take up the mantle of the Great Commission and go out, therefore, preach to all people, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and let people be made disciples. Our message should not be one of fear and bigotry, one of love, but also righteous anger. The righteousness of God calls us to tell folk the truth. I don't like when folk tell me the truth. Hurt my feelings. I get in my, I get in my feelings real bad. I almost make you want to cuss. <laughs> but the reality is when we engage them with the truth in love, they hear the voice of Jesus telling them, I love you better than who you are right now because I died for you. This is the mantle of engagement we should have and not be afraid to say. When we extend the invitation, say, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We ought to be saying that it comes through Jesus. The engagement that we should have, the mantle of engagement that we should have is one that should propel people forward to the kingdom of God. The message of the kingdom is not one of damnation, it's one of eternal abundance. Framed within giving up stuff we don't want to give up. Living sometimes the way we don't want to live, but knowing that as we engage God, he engages us. As the author in Revelation said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open up, I will come in to you, and I will sup with you, and you will sup with me. Will we let people know that that is how God wants to engage them, to be intimately acquainted with them, to let them know that they are loved abundantly and eternally. They might not pack the church, 
but they'll be willing to say, what must I do to be saved? Beloved, beloved, let us take up the mantle and let us go forth boldly, proclaiming what God wants us to do, remembering our experience, being aware of our environment, and being engagement, engaging in our world. Let's pray. Father, just as Jesus took up the mantle as he left the comfort of his home as he picked up the voice of John and the message of John and as he shared the message may we too be like Jesus our spirits may not be one of a significant dove a voice or the devil tempting us but whatever it is, let it be used and placed on us as a mantle to proclaim your gospel to all who need it. And may we be bold in doing that and go forward knowing that you have made a way in the desert. And let us be the light that people who are in darkness see so they can come to know you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And for his sake we pray. Amen. As we extend the invitation to Christian discipleship, the gospel message is that Jesus Christ came, he died, and he rose again from the dead. That he is coming again. If you don't know Jesus in the pardon of your sins, you need to know him. As we stand, words ain't on the, on the screen. But the words say, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from an Daniel's vein. As sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their good to sing. Sing that with us. There is.